to follow up with that. And the title of today's message, it's going to be short, but the title of today's message is, It Is Well. And as we get started, I want to ask you a question, and I want to ask you to be courageous enough to raise your hand if this applies to you. Have you ever, has anyone in here ever said, and it doesn't have to be these inexact words, but whatever the expression was, the intent was the same, I don't know how much more of this I can take. Raise your hand. Then I'm preaching to the right group. Because my intent today is this, to show those of you who are in Christ. Now, i got to tell you, if you're out of Christ, you're in a hopeless situation. But you don't have to stay in that hopeless situation because before this service ends, we're going to give you an opportunity to get into Christ. Amen. And you need to be into Christ. Yes. I'm not saying into religion. I ain't talking about, you know, changing your dress code and your hairstyle to fit in with a hypocritical religious group of people. No, I ain't talking about that at all. I'm talking about getting into the ark of safety, the only one who truly loves you, getting into a relationship with him because he is your only protection. To those of us who are in Christ, who found our way, whether it's 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, or yesterday, or even this morning, we are in the safest place you could ever be. And in Christ, you are a brand new creature. Brand new creature. Many of you have heard me share this story years ago when I ran into the great T.L. Osborne in an airport and had a conversation with him. And before he left, I asked him, I said, Dr. Osborne, what's the most important message for the church today? And before he walked away and without hesitating, giving any thought to his answer, it was already in him. He turned around and he looked at me and he said, tell them who they are. They don't know who they are. So my goal this morning is to tell you, you are more than who you think you are, yes. and you are more than who you appear to be. Yes. You are invincible, invulnerable, and unbreakable. And if you've ever thought you were at your breaking point, that's only because you were thinking like the old man and not the new man. Because in Christ, your breaking point is far beyond the enemy's reach. He can't break you. Amen? The title of this morning's message, and as I said, it won't take long, is It Is Well. I want to let you know that the greater one abides within you, and he's greater than your weariness. He's greater than your depression. He's greater than your problem. He's greater than your enemy. He's greater than your anxiety. Amen? The life within you is simply greater greater than anything you could ever face. I want you to draw your attention to Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 10. I'm going to read it to you out of the Amplified Version. It says, if, everyone say if. I love how the Holy Spirit started this sentence by saying if. Just, just like in the book of James when it says when. The Holy Spirit's a perfect teacher. Every word in the Bible is there on purpose and for a purpose. When James said, count it all joy, when, he didn't use the word if. That lets you know trials will come. Yes, sir. But when the Spirit spoke through Solomon in the book of Proverbs, he used the word if. Because although you cannot avoid the day of adversity, the day of adversity will come, but you need not faint in the day of adversity. Why? Because the greater one, greater than your adversity, is within you. Are y'all here this morning? See, well, I think the greatest revelation the church could have is twofold. And you can't have one without the other. The first revelation of who he is. But when we understand that it's in him that we live and move and have our being, and to know him is to know a greater revelation of myself, I really can't know him without knowing who I really am. Y'all follow me? So our journey is also a journey into self-discovery. You can't have a revelation of him being omnipotent and you being impotent. Let me say that again because that went. You cannot have a revelation of him being omnipotent and us being impotent. You follow what I'm saying? Because if I'm in him, 
His strength is mine. If I'm in Him, His joy is mine. If I'm in Him, my breaking point is His breaking point. And you can't break me unless you were to find a way to break Him. Why? Because my... Paul said it this way. The life that I live, I ain't living it on my own no more. I have discovered a new kind of life, and of course I'm paraphrasing, but this is what he said. The life that I live, I now live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So what Paul said is I've learned the secret to being more than a conqueror, and that's to abide in the conqueror. That when I abide in him, I am in such a safe place, you can't hurt me. Oh, you can still throw words at me and you can still form weapons, but the Bible remains true. Y'all here this morning. There is no weapon. How many weapons can prosper against you? No weapon. Now, the Bible never says they won't be launched. It doesn't even say you won't hear them whiz by. But no weapon formed against you, can prosper. So in, even in the, standing in the middle of the battlefield, with it blasting all around you, though the mountains be removed and the earth be shaken, the child of God cannot be broken. It is well with us because of who he is and what he's done. So again in the book of Proverbs he says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. But it doesn't have to be that way because the Holy Spirit put that word if. So in the day of adversity, we can win. In the day of adversity, we can stand strong. In the day of adversity, we can remain unchanged. Let me, can I throw this at you? If you're unchangeable, you become unmanageable by the devil. If you're unchanged, listen, listen, listen. I don't know if you've ever done this. I grew up in a small town and we were poor. We didn't, I couldn't even afford the OR. We were just poor, P-O. Only the wealthy people in our town could afford the OR. My family had the OR and layaway. So we used to entertain, we would entertain ourselves by creating a little hill of dirt and taking water and pour, man, that's sad. As I think about it, I didn't even have a Tonka truck, man. I played in the mud for fun. We would we'd create a little like little dip in the top of the dirt hill and we'd pour water in it. And then we would trace, make the water go whichever way we wanted to go by the way we traced our finger down the mound. Years later, I received a great revelation from that really <laughs> sad childhood. And that was this, that for, for many of us, the way the devil manages us is by creating a path of least resistance. Because we don't ever want to be uncomfortable. We want to avoid all adversity. We're not willing to walk through the dark places. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. All the devil has to do is make this spot uncomfortable, that spot a little uncomfortable, and we will follow the path of least resistance. Yes, sir. I've had people say, Pastor, this is where the Lord planted me. I am here until we all die together. <laughs> then the first time I say something they don't really like. <laughs> Why? Because all the devil had to do is make them a little uncomfortable and if we're changeable, we're manageable. Amen, but when we're on, I'm not talking about being hard-headed. I'm talking about we are not controlled by ex external circumstances. If we're unchangeable, we're unmanageable. Amen. The devil can't manage to sway us because if this is where the Lord placed us, if this is what the Lord said to do, if this is what the Lord gave to you, you don't change until your instructions from heaven are changed. That's right. That's right. Hallelujah. So the same verse out of the New Living Translation says this. If you fail under pressure, 
your strength is too small. But it doesn't have to be that way. Once again, we can be strong. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. Now, really, if you, you, it, it, it doesn't mean about laughing because really that word joy, it, 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 it's, it's a word that's meant to express the covenant. And really what it means is this. The covenant of the Lord is our strength. Yes. So really you could, in that place of joy, you could put whatever aspect of the covenant you wanted. The loving kindness of the Lord uh-huh. is my strength. Yes, the goodness of the Lord is my strength. Yes, the faithfulness of the Lord is my strength. The word of the Lord is my strength. It doesn't have to be just joy, which meaning if something happens and you're not exactly hilariously happy that day, you ain't weak because it ain't just about hilarious joy. It's about the goodness, the faithfulness. Though my circumstances have changed, my God has not. Amen. The unchangeableness of God is my strength. Yeah. Because I don't have to be weak as long as he is strong. Yeah. And if he is strong, I'm unbreakable. Y'all following me this morning? Once again, we can't avoid the day of adversity. Because there's a very real devil who does not want you advancing in kingdom. He doesn't want it. He worked too hard to put you in a place of misery. He doesn't want you waltzing free just because they sang a good song at worship. Oh, no, baby. He's going to confront and he's going to affront and he's going to assault you. But he cannot break you. Because if you are in Christ, you're unmanageable, you're unbreakable, you're invincible, you're invulnerable to the tactics of the enemy. Right. All we got to know is who he is. Yes, sir. Amen? Yes. And now, in, 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 in expressing this word, there's a great many Bible characters we could use. But I don't want to draw necessarily an example from the Bible because it's too easy for you and I to dismiss Bible characters because we think of them somehow as superheroes, right? They weren't normal men and women. They didn't have our problems. They lived too long ago and sometimes, but I want to draw from an example much more relevant and a man, you, you, you've heard a song he wrote, but you may not know the name Horatio Spafford. Horatio Spafford was just an ordinary man. You don't ever, he, as far as I know, he never preached a sermon. He certainly was not a televangelist. There was no television back then. He didn't have a Facebook page. He wasn't, he didn't have a million followers on Instagram. He was just a good man, good father who loved the Lord and was trying to make his way in, in the earth. He lived in Chicago in the late, eight, in 1870, thereabouts. He was a lawyer by trade, but he wasn't necessarily a successful lawyer. So what he was trying to do was create his fortune. And I'm giving you the backstory. He was trying to create his fortune in real estate. So he decided to invest in real estate in Chicago down on the lake. That was the up and coming area. And as he started investing everything he had into the real estate market and things were going well, he suffered the first tragedy. Of his four children, he had one son and his son died suddenly and unexpectedly. It was such a tragedy, it was hard for the family to recover. So Horatio thought, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my entire family to Europe so we can get away from the pain for a while. So he bought some tickets to go to Europe. Before they disembarked, what we call the Great Chicago Fire broke out. Burned over 800 buildings on the waterfront. 100% of the buildings he owned were on that waterfront. And this was in the age before insurance was, uh, I don't want to bore you, but I'm talking about an ordinary man. A hundred percent of everything he invested was on that water, river, lakefront, and it all burned. This was in the age insurance was available, but not yet mandatory. And it was considered an unnecessary business expense, so he had none. That meant a hundred percent loss. Everyone say fortune. Fortune gone. But he still had the tickets, but he couldn't go because he had to try to redeem something from the ashes. So he put his wife and his three young daughters on a ship to go to Europe. En route, almost to their destination, there was an accident, and the ship sank. Horatio didn't know what had happened until he received a telegram from his wife. The telegram had two words on it, saved alone. 
family gone. As soon as he could, Horatio scraped together some borrowed money, bought a ticket to get to England to get his wife. As he was sailing the ship on the ship following the exact same route, when they got to the place where the other ship sank, the captain announced to all, this is where the accident occurred. And Horatio, these were his words, he walked to the railing of the ship so he could see the spot where his daughter sank below the waves. Fortune gone, family gone. When he looked into that place, he said, I felt inspired. Everyone say it as well. Uh, what I want to share with you this morning is you are capable, more capable than you might realize of surviving what you're having to go through. Because if God would inspire Horatio, don't you know the Bible says, is this okay this morning? He's a very present help in trouble. So when you're in trouble, he's still there. All we have to do is make sure that like the, the, the men of old, we have eyes that see and ears that hear. Because if we have eyes that see, we can see him with us in the trouble. If we have ears that hear, we can hear his voice in the trouble. Horatio, looking at that spot, said he felt inspired to write some words. I want to read to you his words. This is how he started. When peace, like a river, attendeth my way. When sorrows, like sea billows, roll. Sea billows are waves. He's looking at the waves that swallowed his daughters. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to know. It is well, it is well. With my soul. Can you imagine losing your fortune and your family, but holding on to your sanity? Let me rephrase that. Can you imagine losing your fortune and your family, but keeping the faith? Everyone say it as well. Just because you are being attacked, just because you're in a storm, you don't have to fall apart. You don't have to crumble. You are made of divine substance. You are a child of God. You're the life that flows through, you're not no mere mortal. You're a child of the living God. You have his life, you have his word, you have his abilities. You can... Like Horatio of old, stand right at the spot. And instead of feeling depressed, feel inspired. How do you feel inspired when you're standing at the spot where your daughters just died? Inspired means in the spirit. The Holy Ghost was with them. The Holy Ghost was standing at that very spot with Horatio. And as Horatio was looking at it, you can hear the Holy Spirit. Whispering in his ear. That's what inspiration is. Horatio. Horatio. It is well. It's well. My word hasn't changed. I'm still with you and not against you. See, sometimes when we're in that spot, we may not know what the next step is. But hear me when I tell you this. We don't need to know the next step. What we need to know is the sun. Two of you got it, and for that I'm grateful. We don't need to know what the next step is. All we need to know is who the Son is. Because the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. And if you know the Lord, he'll direct your steps. Horatio, listen to this. Before I can give you the rest of Horatio's words. Horatio was no superman, and that's the reason why I want to use him as an example. He was just an ordinary man. And if God can give an ordinary man, not even a minister, a real estate investor, a lawyer, but God can give that man such supernatural strength to survive the losing of his fortune and his family, what can he do for you? What will he do for you? 
What has he done for you? Everyone say, I'm unbreakable. We all like to think they're unbreakable, but we need to know we're unbreakable because when you're going through it, other people may listen to your story, but they ain't walking your steps. You need to know I'm unbreakable because of who he is. I can make it through this valley. I can make it to the other side because of the one who already died. I can make it through. The book of Philippians says this in chapter 4, verse 6. Be anxious, which means have anxiety for nothing, but in everything. Everyone say the Bible is true. In everything, not just the good things, not just the comfortable things, but in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God, and listen to this, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension. One modern translation words it this way, the peace of God which makes no earthly sense. I like that. You and I have access to peace not born of the earth. We need to understand that the peace of the earth ain't the same kind of peace as heaven. When Jesus said, my peace I give you, not as the earth gives you, he was saying there's two different kinds of peace. The, 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 the peace of the earth is fragile. If you ever looked at a pond and there wasn't a ripple on the surface, it was just like a mirror, people look at it and say, that is so peaceful. You know what it takes to disrupt that peace? A pebble. All you got to do is pick up a pebble throw it into the pond, and it's no longer peaceful. It's disrupted. That's the peace of the earth. All the devil has to do for some of us is throw a pebble. And, and, and then we are like the, the, the James again talks about the, the one who's up and down and here and there, and he let that man expect to receive nothing from God. Because he's up and down, tossed to and fro with the waves of the pond. But there's another kind of peace that you and I have access to. You following me this morning? It's like Jesus gave us a big toolbox. Yes, sir. And through thanksgiving, thanksgiving and praise is the way you open up the toolbox. And inside the toolbox is everything you'll ever need to do anything he's ever called you to do and to conquer every enemy who comes at you. Yes. And in that toolbox is a thing called peace. Yes. Now when we grow anxious, the toolbox don't open. But when through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving in everything, giving our praise to God in the middle of our storm, saying, God, I'm so glad you already paid the price for me to have victory. You already, the stripes were already laid on your back for me to be healed. Yes. Your word is as unchangeable as is your nature. Amen. So I thank you, Father. Victory is already mine. Because doesn't the Bible say faith is? The vic not not going to become the victory someday, but faith is the victory. That does what? It overcomes the world. Faith is. Everyone say faith is. Faith is a very present help in trouble. Because faith is what connects you to him. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will do what? Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let me continue reading a few of these words that Horatio felt inspired to write. Listen to this. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. These were the words he wrote at that spot. How many times, hear me, from a place of pain, Horatio wrote words that have been sung countless times by countless people and have undoubtedly saved countless souls. There's no telling what God can do through you and I if we simply will not fall apart in the day of adversity. What dream could he give you? What song could you pen? What 
poem could you write? Yes. When through perseverance and the patience of the saints, we inherit the promises of God. Amen, mm. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part but the whole. Is nailed to the cross, I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. And when he kept referring to my soul, I couldn't help but think about David, who said, Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? I will yet praise him. Y'all follow me this morning. For me, be it Christ, be it Christ hence to live. If Jordan above me shall roll, no pain shall be mine, for in death as in life thou wilt whisper thy peace to my soul. You and I need to know that the same peace that Horatio accessed at that moment standing at that rail is available to you and I right now. And the battle cry of our heart, in fact, the only cry of our heart should always be no matter when they, add, listen, don't go looking for pity or pity is what you'll find. When somebody asks you how it's going, they should never be able to tell the hell you're going through by the look on your face. They should never be able to tell the storm you're going through by the behavior that you're portraying. They, they should never hear defeat in your voice. Why? Because it is well. It is well with my soul. It might not be well out here, but I ain't making life choices by what's going on out here. He whispered in my soul, it is well. So when they ask me, Jimmy, how you doing? It is well. How's everything going? It is well. How can you say that? Because he died. They put him in a tomb. And he rose again. And now he's forever seated at the right hand of God making intercession for me. If he did all of that and his word changeth not and he changeth not and faith is the victory, then defeat has nothing to do with me. Are y'all here this morning? As Christians, we ought to be the happiest people on the planet. A depressed Christian ought to be an oxy, two words that don't go together. It's an oxymoron, don't make sense. A depressed Christian. Yeah. Pastor, you got to understand, I'm going through it. Yeah, baby, we all have. Your story might make me cry, but I guarantee you mine would bring tears to a grown man's eyes as well. Yes, Life is a full contact sport, baby. If you ain't figured it out yet, Sometimes we get hit. But Paul said we fall, but we don't stay down. We get back up. Why? Because the greater one is in us and he never leaves us. And when we fall, he picks us up. We got to be Jesus minded instead of devil minded. We got to be victory focused instead of trial focused. You don't need to tell everybody about what you're going through. The Bible says, tell him about it. Come to him in prayer. He is your solution. I might be able to give you some sympathy. He can give you a solution. I heard a spiritual father tell me once, I'll try to hurry up. That clock's crooked, so I don't know exactly what time it is. I heard a spiritual father one time say, never tell anyone your problem unless they're capable of being the solution. If they cannot, if they do not have the capacity of being a solution to your problem, then why are you telling it? Can we be honest? Pity. We want pity. We watch too many hee haw episodes. Doom. Despair. Agony on me. Whoa. And my wife's helping me. I don't watch it no more. <laughs> Deep, dark depression excessive and excessive misery. <laughs> Why are you saying that? If it, huh? if it weren't for bad luck. You know I do got a sermon I got to follow with. <laughs> if it weren't for bad luck. If it weren't for bad luck. I wouldn't have no luck at all. I'd have no luck at all. Good God, that's horrible. <laughs> Why would a saint of God ever say things like that? Why? Because we walk by sight. And we ought not be walking by sight. We ought to be walking by faith. Amen. 
Because by faith, if the Lord were to open your eyes and you were to survey the hills around you, you would discover that you are surrounded by angels of God that no weapon, the enemy's got plans, but they're all going to fail. You would discover that God is here, the Father is here, the Holy Ghost is here, and the Son of God is praying for you. Victory is not something that's going to be. It already is. I've already won. Hallelujah, Father. I'm trying to hear. I told you it'd be a sermonette. John chapter 14, verse 27. Again, the Passion Translation. I only have eight more pages. We'll make it. Listen to the words of your Messiah. I leave the gift of peace with you. My peace. Not the kind of fragile peace given by the world, but my perfect peace. Then he says, don't yield to fear or be troubled in your hearts. Instead, be courageous. Don't yield to it. Don't give in to it. You and I have a lot of opportunities to be afraid. But we don't have to give in to it. We'll have a lot of opportunities to get into despair. But we don't got to give in to it. I just recently heard a, a, a minister say, quit watching television and start reading the Bible. And you'll be happier. Yes, sir. That's right. I think we ought to get into the book of Psalms and find out what he did for David. Yes, and start saying some things like, bless the Lord, oh my soul. And all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Mm. Hallelujah, Father. Everyone say this. I am his. Therefore, I am unbreakable. Say that again. I am his. Therefore. I'm unbreakable. You ain't fragile. I know you, maybe you were. You might have been. You might have been a victim of so much pain and so much betrayal that you became fragile. But the day you got saved, hear me, please. The day you got saved, old things. They all passed away. Those no longer are, are those are not identifiers anymore. You, they only exist now in your memory, because in the records of heaven they gone. In the records of heaven that's been erased. The label you wear now is not of a lo loser. It's not the abused. It's not the abandoned. It's not the betrayed. It's not the unloved. It's not the unqualified. Those may have been the labels that men stuck on you before, but God has ripped those labels off and put a brand new label on you. And the label that you now wear is beloved. You are loved of God. You're the apple of his eye. God's got tats. Did you know that? God's got tats. And you know what it says? I love Jimmy. And somehow through divine operation, every time he looks at it, it's your name he sees. But his, he has inscribed. Well, pastor, the Lord doesn't got tats. The Bible says your name is inscribed. Thank you, Lord. He wears your name. Uh, so let me tell it, Isaac. I tell you, when it's your sermon, you can tell it however you want to tell it. <laughs> but I like to think God's got a big old heart on that massive bicep. Yeah. Maybe both. It says, I love Jimmy. Yeah. So whenever Jimmy's in trouble, God goes, I love that kid. I think I'll go rescue him. Come on. Because I often find myself in trouble. But he has never abandoned me in those places. I can't tell you how many times, and I got to hurry up. I know I got to hurry up. How many times she and I have been at complete and utter dependence. Nothing. Homeless. And we'd receive an envelope plea from someone I didn't know. Before the, we weren't on the internet. Get an envelope from somebody in California, I didn't know the name, $2,000. I wrote them back saying, keep it up, baby. The Lord is pleased with you. If you want him to be more pleased, do it again. They ain't never done it again. 
But what I'm telling you is this, no matter where you are, God still knows how to make ravens yes, he does. Yes. get a happy meal yes, he and does. fly to your door. Yes. God will still come to your rescue every single yes. time. But what you and I got to do is hold on to the faith. Don't let the tragedy of the moment, it might rip your fortune. It might strip from you your family. But don't let it ever take your faith. Because if you've got faith, you'll get it all back yes, and more. Everyone say, it is well. It is well. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. I got two more verses, eight more pages. Don't be afraid. Let not your heart be troubled. But we have this treasure, the Bible says, in earthen vessels. And that's where we get confused sometimes. Because what we see, we think we are. I, that's why I loved what Jaleesa said. This is earth. The earth has got all kind of pigments. But what I am on the inside is not what you see. The only reason I don't look like Cleve is I lack the pigmentation. That's it. On the inside, we're exactly the same. And when we get to heaven, I'm going to sing and dance better than he does. Because on the inside, there's a soul train. Ooh. The only problem is this earthen vessel, but baby, when this earthen vessel falls away, you're going to see bell-bottom pants. What's that got to do with my sermon? Nothing. I just wanted to say it. So you know what you got to look forward to when we all get to, when you see that guy strolling. Remember, you remember on Soul Train, they would form the train and they would dance down? When you see a white guy going down the streets of heaven, kicking, and you wonder, who is that fool? That be me, because it's what I wanted to always do, but my flesh got in the way. And as soon as, because what, what are you saying? I'm saying on the inside, I'm as free. You want it? Free is good. Free is good. When you realize that you can just, it is for freedom that he sets you free. It is well. We have this treasure. It's in an earthen vessel so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. The Passion Translation, you can read it for yourself, but it ends it by saying this. We may get knocked down, but we ain't never knocked out. Right. Hallelujah, Father. But in order to do, you got to know, and I mean, you really got to know, and I'm going to bring this to a close. You've got to know who you are in him, and it would do you well to remind yourself. Don't accept your identity from them. Right. Don't, don't, because all they know is what they see. Accept your identity from him because he's the one who made you. And he's divinely dedicated to your potential, to pulling out of you every treasure he placed within you. So understand that God and God alone as your creator has the right to be your labeler. No one else has your right to be your labeler. No one else can define you simply by what they see. God defines you by who you really are. And here's, here's, I want to give you one final key as we bring this to a close. I'm sure you've heard of a man called the Apostle Paul. Yes, sir. Paul reached a place in his life where he felt like he was at his breaking point. And he reveals to us what he did when he was at his breaking point. And this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8. Paul said this, he said, concerning this, and he was talking about a messenger from Satan, who vexed him and tormented him and was constantly poking and prodding him. Paul said that I implored the Lord, I begged the Lord three times that it might leave me. And for the sake of teaching, I want you to understand that the word three is not a numerical definition, but it's poetic. And what it means is this, Paul said, every prayer of mine, this occupied my prayer time. Have you all ever had an outside circumstance that every time you prayed, that's what you prayed about? 
because it just, it never left you. It was always there. And every time you prayed, you might just, you all staying with me. Don't disconnect yet. You might have started out your prayer with praise, but pretty soon you're focusing on your problem. Because your problem is living in your mind. That's where Paul was. Paul was saying, every time I prayed, I begged God, take this from me. Every time I went before the Lord, I, brought, I thought about what the devil was doing. Come on, brother. You're right. I went before God talking about the devil. On, God, would you take this from me? Would you change the situation? Yeah. Would you change him? Would you change her? God, you and I both know she's the problem. Uh -huh. yes, sir. Would you change her? And I kept begging the Lord to do this. I didn't actually beg the Lord to do that. And I've, I've heard so many preachers say that this incident in the Bible is proof that God says no. That God says no to your deliverance, that God says no to your healing, that God says no to his own word. Because when, God, when, when Paul begged God to be delivered, God gave him a revelation instead of a deliverance. But I want you to hear me. Are you all still, you're still connected? What you need is a revelation. Because when your revelation becomes bigger than your environment, the devil loses his ability to contain you. So when God gives you a revelation, that revelation is your way out. You following me? What often we wish is that he would remove the thing and we'd be in the same environment without that thing vexing us. But you've got to understand, if he chased away the mosquito, a bee will take its place. What he's got to do is make you victorious on the inside so it don't matter what happens on the outside. And, and here's what Paul, or what the Lord told Paul, but he answered me, my grace is always more than enough for you. I've read this, Lee, in various translations, and I don't see no in any one of God's answers. It doesn't matter what translation I read, I never find a no. So how can a preacher stand up and say, God says no? God didn't say no. What God did say is, I got something better for you. Yes, sir. And can you give me two minutes to yes, really draw this home? Please. Let's imagine that Steve comes to me in a very bad strait, and he says, Pastor, I got some bad things happening. I need $100. And my overwhelming generosity and the awareness of what he really needs knows $100 ain't going to get him but through the day. So instead of giving him $100, I peel out five $100 bills and give it to Steve. Bring it on. <laughs> See me after church. Now, Steve could, if he's being a legalist about it, Steve could go tell everyone, I asked pastor for $100, and he didn't give it to me. Right? He could say that. He could say, you know, I, all I wanted was $100, and I went to the pastor, and I asked him for $100. He wouldn't even give me $100. And if someone didn't understand what was going on, they would think, well, the pastor's pretty stingy. The Lord is pretty stingy. Well, how much did, did he didn't give you anything? Oh, yeah, he gave me something, but it wasn't $100 I asked for. Well, what did he give you? He gave me five hundred dollars. And you're telling everyone he told you no? Well, he didn't give me a hundred dollars, but he gave you five hundred dollars. But you missed the point. He didn't give me a hundred dollars. No, he gave you. See, God is more than enough. What he gave Paul was exceedingly abundantly above and beyond anything Paul could hope to ask or imagine. What Paul was saying, I need you to drive this messenger from Satan away from me. And what God said is, I'm going to give you a revelation of my grace because when you understand my grace, Paul, you'll never need pray to me again about what the devil's doing. That's good. And can I tell you this, as we bring this to a close, there's not one time from this point on in Paul's life you'll ever find him praying about what the devil was doing. Wow. 
Not one more. Because once he got this revelation of grace, he said, okay, I got it now. Now when I'm weak, I know I'm strong. And I will therefore rejoice in my infirmities and what I go through. Because when I know when I'm shipwrecked, he's the ship. I know that when I'm in trouble, he's the helper. I know when there is no way, he's the way maker. What you and I need more than anything is an understanding of God's grace. So that you and I can know that when we're going through the trial, it is well. When we are going through something we don't understand, we didn't do it to ourselves, we didn't bring it on, we just suddenly find ourselves in that storm. It is well. And the way we know it's well is because His grace is unchanging. Did this help you this morning? Would you go ahead and give the Lord a hand clap of praise? For those of you visiting with RLC, I want to tell you, I, I, we, at RLC, we only have very simple aspirations. And that is to know the Father, to know how great his love is for us, and to know who we are in him. Because if we know those three things, we will be the victorious overcomers our world needs. You know, if we look around, I think you and I would agree, we don't need any more weak churches. We don't need any more theology and eschatology that puts everything good into the future. We need to have a boldness of faith that will stand up. As Jalisa said, so would you stop doing that when I have to preach? Could you just flub it up one time, make me feel better? But what a way to, to stand up and say, no, hatred, no. Division, no. Poverty, no. Sickness, no. Not here, not now. We don't do fear. No, sir. And be bold in our faith because when we're bold in our faith, we'll discover the greatness of our God. Amen. Go ahead and stand to your feet. Amen. Hallelujah, Father. And I want to ask your forgiveness. I told you it'd be a sermonette. I almost made it. <laughs> but my heart yearns. For you to be all that God created, for, for us to be all God created us to be. So, Father, we thank you for your word this morning. As we bring our time together physically to a close, we declare we are more than who we appear to be. Father, we know that in Christ we are unbreakable. In Christ we are immovable, immovable, and we are strong. So, Father, I pray right now in Jesus' name that every person in here going through a trial, every person in here going through a storm, every person in here who's in uncharted waters, be the navigator of their life and reveal yourself to them to be the God of grace, a grace that is so great they need not fear anything. I thank you for it. And if you agree with me, would you shout amen? amen. With that, I do, you are dismissed. Go in the grace of God. If you need prayer this morning, our prayer team is going to come up here. If you don't know Jesus, come up and meet Jesus. If you need prayer for healing, it's a good time to be healed. God bless you.